Hi everyone, uh, today we're going to make a quick review of the Financial Markets and Institutions book. Let's uh, start with chapter one. Uh, in, the chap in the first chapter, we will make an introduction to the financial markets and institutions. Uh, let's first go over what a financial system is and uh, who are the actors in the financial system. The financial system enables uh, actors in the uh, in this uh, market to come together uh, in, and the main actors are ultimate lenders ultimate borrowers financial instruments um, financial intermediaries and legal and administrative regulators the ultimate lenders are individuals or organizations with excess saving meaning their their uh, their uh, income is greater than their expenditures on the other hand there are some uh, ultimate borrowers uh, with a funding gap so they must come together uh, and they, uh, in order to uh, finance the funding gap, borrowers need to come together with the uh, lenders. And uh, uh, the, there is a flow uh, of these funds through financial instruments, which are means to transfer funds from lenders to borrowers. And they represent the rights and liabilities uh, of these uh, actors. Um, and there are also some financial intermediaries, organizations bringing lenders and borrowers together, and uh, which enable matching the amounts of funds uh, that will be transferred. Uh, we also have legal and administrative regulators uh, that assure that the transactions are made in an easy and orderly manner. In the financial system, we, we can observe two types of financing, uh, namely direct financing or indirect financing. In, in direct financing, borrowers directly find lenders without a need uh, for an intermediary. Uh, whereas in the indirect financing, borrowers and lenders use financial intermediary organizations to find each other, to match the quantity and maturity uh, of uh, transfer of funds and uh, to ensure that the transactions are made in trust. Um, there are two types of uh, uh, financial markets. Uh, we can classify them as money markets or capital markets, uh, depending on the maturity of the financial instruments. Uh, in the money markets, financial instruments with a maximum uh, of one year maturity are traded, whereas in the capital markets, financial instruments with, uh, with a maturity of longer than one year are traded. We can also classify financial, classify financial markets as organized or over-the-counter markets. Organized markets are uh, markets that work with specific places, buildings, managers, and rules. O uh, on the other hand, over-the-counter markets uh, do not have specific places, buildings, managers, and rules. Another classification of financial markets uh, is primary versus secondary. In primary markets, uh, financial instruments that, that, that have been issued for the first time are sold uh, and bought, uh, while in the secondary markets, financial instruments that are already trading are bought and sold. They are traded this way. Uh, another classification uh, is uh, spot markets versus future markets. In spot markets, payment and exchange between buyers and sellers occur immediately. Uh, whereas in the future markets, payment and exchange between buyers and sellers occur at a later date. As uh, we are now familiar with financial markets, uh, we can introduce the, the, the concept of efficiency. Uh, efficient, uh, efficiency uh, of markets is important uh, because it's, a, it's like a benchmark. In fact, uh, in, in the real world, no market is perfectly efficient, but there are some assumptions regarding uh, efficient markets. In efficient markets, uh, no single participant alone has the power to change the price of a financial instrument. And the prices, we expect that the prices would reflect real values of these uh, financial assets or financial instruments. Therefore, it's impossible to beat the market uh, as no one par participant alone has the power to change the price and the prices reflect real values as as i mentioned and uh, we can say we say that an asset is underpriced when its market price is below its real value or it's uh, we call this real value intrinsic or economic value at the same time 
So if the if it if an asset is underpriced, uh, we we can say an an asset uh, or a financial instrument is underpriced when the market price is below its uh, intrinsic value. Uh, while an asset uh, is said to be overpriced when its market price is over its uh, intrinsic or economic value. Uh, and uh, even in semi-efficient markets, uh, in, in, and this occurs, this fact occurs in semi-efficient markets because in uh, perfectly efficient markets, we expect that the uh, market price uh, is equal to the real value. So there is no underpricing or overpricing, but in semi-efficient markets, we can observe overpricing or underpricing. Um, interest rates are uh, important factors in uh, financial markets because they represent a cost for the borrowing party or uh, we can uh, we can call them uh, ultimate uh, lender uh, ultimate borrowers uh, whereas uh, interest rates rep uh, represent a return for the lending party remember the ultimate lenders so market interest rates depend on the demand and supply of loanable funds uh, provided by the lenders and uh, demanded by the borrowers so uh, these two parties come together in financial markets and depending on the uh, interaction between the demand and supply of, of these funds uh, market interest rates uh, are formed when the demand for loanable funds funds increases, uh, uh, keeping other things constant, the equilibrium interest rate increases. Uh, while when the supply of loanable funds increases, the equilibrium interest rate decreases. You can think of the interest rate as the price of uh, loanable funds. So depending on the uh, supply and demand, interest rates shift. A higher level of income results in an increase in the demand of money and therefore an increase in the equilibrium interest rate. We call this the income, income effect. On the other hand, an increase in the general price levels results in an increase in the demand for money. So when inflation rises, there, there is a higher demand for money and therefore uh, we expect uh, that the, in, uh, the equilibrium interest rates will rise. So we call this the price effect. Uh, speak, uh, speaking of interest rates, it is important uh, to, to be able to determine future values of uh, present values and uh, present values of uh, some amount of future values that we expect to receive in the future. So if we, for example, if we invest some amount of money today and uh, if we wonder how much uh, our money will accumulate in, uh, at some future date, we can find this by compounding. In fact, compounding is the, finding the future value of some present value uh, using some uh, interest rate and uh, compounding it for uh, some number of periods. So future value equals present value times 1 plus the interest rate of the period to the power n, which is the number of periods. Similarly, we, we can find the present value of some future value. If we expect to receive some amount of money in the future, we may wonder what it is worth as, 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 as of today. So in order to find the present value, we can discount those future values simply by uh, dividing uh, the future value, this, uh, the future sum, the future amount uh, by one plus the interest rate to the power n. So instead of multiplying to when we're discounting, we, we divide by 1 plus i to the power n. Uh, so the choices of investors uh, in, in financial markets depend on their level of wealth and uh, the expected return uh, of the, the financial instruments and at, at, at the same time, uh, the riskiness of these uh, financial tools. So when uh, investors make investment choices, uh, investment decisions, uh, they need to consider the expected return and the risk level, the riskiness. Uh, investors try to maximize the expected return while they, they, they are trying to uh, minimize risk. 
uh, but uh, there is a relationship between risk and return. The greater the uh, the risk, usually the greater the return. So there there is a trade off. And um, the investors' uh, choices also depend on the liquidity of these financial instruments. So how much money, uh, how how much budget they have, uh, and the the liquidity of uh, financial instruments are influential on the investment choices, as well as the expected return and risk level of financial instruments. So what is risk? Risk refers to the likelihood that we will receive a return on an investment that is different from the return uh, that we expect to make. So if there is a deviation between the uh, real, uh, the observed values and expected values, we can uh, we we we, uh, we call this risk a difference, a deviation from expected return. Um, so we can cal calculate risk either by uh, using uh, by computing the standard deviation of returns, uh, and we also call this volatility or uh, variance of returns. So both uh, variance and standard deviation are measures of risk. In fact, standard deviation is the square root of uh, variance. As I mentioned before, the greater the perceived risk, the greater the return required. Why? Because uh, to, uh, to, to compensate for uh, the, r the additional risk uh, investors bear, assume, uh, they would like to have a greater return. They require a greater return. So when, uh, in fact, when the market prices appreciate when they rise, uh, investors can have, some, can have some capital gain. So the, uh, what they earn as a result of uh, price appreciation, we call this capital gain. Um, and similarly, uh, when the market prices, uh, it, it, by the same logic, when the market prices depreciate, when they fall down, investors uh, have some capital loss. So depending on the uh, market prices and the cost of these uh, financial instruments, in some investors can have either capital gain or capital loss. Um, we had already mentioned financial instruments, uh, which uh, facilitate the, the transfer of funds. We also call them securities or financial assets or financial tools. Uh, financial instruments show claims on future cash flows of the issuer. There is an issuer of these financial securities, uh, which have a ca shortage of funds. And um, the the buyer of these securities uh, is in fact uh, an asset for the uh, an asset for the buyer whereas it's a liability for the issuer um government bonds uh, we, we say that they have uh, zero default risk meaning the 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 government bonds uh, uh, will not default because uh, we assume that governments will, will not go bankrupt. So there is zero credit risk or default risk. So risky instruments should uh, offer a return greater uh, than the return of uh, government bonds, which are risk-free. Um, we can classify financial instruments as debt instruments or equity instruments. Debt instruments represent a claim on future cash flows of the issuer of the security in the form of interest return. So uh, when the uh, the issuer uh, issues a debt instrument like a bond, uh, the investors expect to get uh, some interest return. Whereas e equity instruments represent a claim on future cash flows uh, in the form of dividends. Uh, when companies uh, issue stocks, the investors can uh, receive some dividends out of the net profit. Um, as we said, fi financial markets provide a platform for uh, ultimate borrowers and ultimate lenders to come together and transfer their funds through financial instruments. In a way, financial markets collect savings and channel them to parties in need of uh, funds in the uh, in, in in need of funds. And um, in financial markets, we can have some uh, financial institutions. We can classify them as depo 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 
depository or non-depository financial institutions. Depository financial institutions uh, are deposit banks and participation banks. Non-depository financial institutions include portfolio management companies, insurance companies, unemployment insurance funds, pension investment funds, and development and investment banks. In fact, depository financial instru uh, institutions create money. And um, thanks to financial uh, institutions, uh, we can have some lower transaction costs uh, because they have a lower cost of uh, obtaining information uh, compared to direct financing. So because they have some uh, advantage, as, advantages such as economies of scale, uh, they have lower costs of uh, obtaining information and uh, therefore they can offer lower transaction costs. So that was all for chapter, that was the summary of chapter one.